God's good. Good all the time. Okay, announcements. There is going to be Bible study, I believe, the next two Tuesdays. Unless Ron wants to leave. I think Ron should leave it. So this week, you're away the next week. Am I away at conference next week? Oh, you may be. <laughs> Just off the start of Wednesday? Oh, that's right. Yeah, we will. Yeah, I'll leave Wednesday. Yeah, yeah. So we're we'll just missing one. one. Yeah, we'll have not this week, but the following week. Five to seven this week. Not this week. I had a birthday here a while back, and they're starting to end off. You have to laugh at it. Um, any other announcements we can share? Yeah, on Wednesday, June 5th, put this on your calendar, we'll be pricing the things for the yard sale items and the yard sale on June 8th. Okay. It's probably a good thing I'm not here because I might buy junk. The hell is still here. It's not me in my town. Why is he always see something you think, boy, you're going to have that? Oh, I agree. And then you get it home and it sits for 20 years and you trip over it? They are treasures, not junk. Right. Yeah, like my dog isn't spoiled, he's just love. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, what? <laughs> any, any uh, other announcements? Well, happy Christ, we thank you. 
for freeing us from the failing of the flesh, that we may be born anew with water and the Spirit. We praise you. Amen. Okay. Uh, what's your favorite hymn you want to sing? How about America? Like mm -hmm. Okay, you're not going to find this up on the screen. Uh, but it's page... Six nine seven or six nine six, which do you prefer? That's her lead leader, she's gonna pick. How about six nine six? Yep. Six nine six.
presence, we come this day with joy because you're God. And joy because you've called us to be your people. And you've called us to be one nation under you. Your prayer is a rich anointing upon both get together. We we'll give you thanks and praise all in Christ's holy name. Use us all. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. 
Israel and our own Any others? It's a of the people in, in the central part of the United States is going through tornado after tornado after tornado. Perfect, thanks. Let's pray. Father God, we do give you thanks and praise for our honored death. We're thankful, Lord, for those of our family that have had such a big impact in how and who we turned out to be. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of our the veterans. Lord, that didn't come home. Freedom doesn't come cheaply. And freedom from our enemy, our ultimate enemy, is something you paid because we couldn't pay that price. We thank you. We thank you, Lord, that we can celebrate things like dress shopping. Pray, Lord, that you would be with all the unspoken requests that we have. I pray for John as he would go for his procedure. We lift up Jake. You know, Lord, the healing touch he needs better, we can not pray. And we thank you, Lord, for Marshall's procedure. And we're praying, Lord, that there's a good outcome here. We thank you, Lord, for family times. And especially during those, those harsh times that inevitably come. We pray, Lord, that you would be with Debbie's family as they would go through this very situation. We do lift up Israel. We lift up, Lord, that, that region. We pray for America. We pray, Lord, that we can get back to what's really important. Not texting on a cell phone, but, Lord, that we are one nation under God. We do pray, Lord, for those in the path of these storms. We thank you, Lord, that you shelter us in the time of storm. We're praying, Lord, that you might enliven our faith. We give you thanks and praise all in Christ's holy name. And now we join together praying the prayer Jesus taught us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, that will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. It is not temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In our next hymn, I would say we ought to do 697. What do you think? Pat's call. Yep. Pat's as short as John Hunter wants to suggest. <laughs>
chapter, or John chapter 3. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do the signs you do apart from the presence of God. And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it does, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you. We speak of what we know, and testify of what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him they have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Message is entitled, Beginning to Live. There are some parts of our faith that are kind of difficult to explain. And one of these is the doctrine of the Trinity. Now the word Trinity doesn't even appear in the page of God's Holy Word. But nevertheless, it is a central doctrine of the church. And like many others who have tried to explain our faith to others, I, I find trying to, to explain something is intimate as a personal relationship with my God and myself. That's not something easily done. Now, I don't know, John. Uh, would you have a hard time explaining to this congregation what love really is like? <laughs> yeah. How about you, Ron? Yes. John? Uh, uh, Barry? Okay. What about you, Jane? We picked on the guys. I mean, there are some things like, how do you explain love? Is it like a Walt Disney uh, movie where the little bumper or little bumper is all Twitter painted or something? Or is it something much, much deeper, much stronger? Like the only son of God dying on the cross for our sin. I don't think I'm alone in having trouble explaining you know, our faith. I mean, how do you explain the grace of God that would take away the sin of the whole world? If the world would only accept it. The PowerPoint says faith is taking the first step, even when you can't see the whole staircase. Sometimes God asks us to step out in faith. Like he did Abraham, when he asked him to go to a nation, to a world that he had never seen. Abraham's family was some earth. And then God was asking him to go to the promised land. I'm reminded of the story of a little girl. 
uh, who was thinking about the things of God, and she was having trouble understanding. So what do you do when you're a child and you got trouble understanding something? You go to someone like John, right? You go to someone like your father, and, and you ask, Dad, what's God like? That sounds like an innocent enough question until you try to put it in the language that a five-year-old can relate to. And finally, I'm sure he gave the same answer that Marshall gave when uh, one of the boys asked one of those questions to him, and he says, go ask your mother. Did you do that a lot? Oh, yeah. Kathy said she yes. <laughs> uh, and so the little girl goes to her mom and says, Mom, what, what, what's God like? And she thought about it for a few moments, and she said, Honey, why don't you ask your Sunday school teacher? So next Sunday, a little girl goes up to her Sunday school teacher. She says, teacher, what's God like? And the Sunday school teacher says, honey, you need to ask your mom or dad. And the little girl leaves all perplexed, and she's thinking to herself, you know, if I, if I live with God as, as long as my mom or my dad or my Sunday school teacher, I think I know a little bit of what God is like. <coughs> I've been a Christian for 40-some years. Think I can explain it adequately either. Maybe Sandy can. She's saying, no, but we gather and we worship God. Why? Because God is real. And our love for Him is real. And we need others to be on the journey with us. Now I went through seminary. I've got a Master of Divinity degree. I, I sat in, I don't know how many classes, uh, participated in discussions where we asked the same questions that old girl asked. And to be quite frank about it, I think I'm just starting to learn the questions. And some of those professors that were trying to teach me, I think I knew more about God than they did. God who created the universe. He sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for our sin. That is not a God that anybody is going to meet, discover, have a relationship with simply by reading a bunch of textbooks. Now, the Bible's a good start. But to know God, you've got to be willing to, to meet God. And I think that's why Revelation 3.20 uh, probably sums up this issue the best. And there in the book of Revelation we read, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Well, during the time that I've served as a pastor, I've discovered, I think, a few things about ministry. And one, my main duty is not to preach sermons that makes everybody feel good. All the time. Hopefully you laugh once in a while. But there ought to be other times where your shoes get so so pinched you about to take them off. If all I do is make you feel good, I'm just a people pleaser. I mean duty it's not officiating weddings or, or just funerals. Or even attending all these conferences that I can't get anybody to go to. By the way, we still have an opening for you in the conference. If anybody wants to go, it's a Carol's died in the pew, and I, I understand why. This is probably going to be fireworks this time. But anyhow, um, my main duty is to even just to pray when others don't want to, or when their body assembles. I think my main duty is a servant of my Lord Jesus Christ. It's to encourage an atmosphere where people can encounter the risen Christ face to face. Now, Nicodemus comes to Jesus under the cover of darkness. And it could very well be he was coming, you know, after the day was done, so Jesus wouldn't be preoccupied with anybody else. I'm not sure I buy that, though. I, I think he was more likely coming because he's probably a little bit embarrassed he didn't come at all. Or. He might have been on a mission from the Sanhedrin. I mean, Nicodemus was an expert in the law. He's a Pharisee, he's a member of the Sanhedrin. But whatever the case, Nicodemus 
He starts his conversation by acknowledging that Jesus had to have been sent by God for him to be able to do the things he did and the, to be able to say the things he did with such authority. And before Nicodemus even gets a chance to even get warmed up, Jesus cuts him off and tells him he had to be born again. And, and Jesus went on to speak about the kingdom of God and the Holy Spirit that enables this all to come about. Now Nicodemus came searching for the Messiah, for the Christ. And when he finds him, all he does is he tells God what God's got to be like and what God's got to do. Nicodemus' God was so small, he could probably keep him in a box. I think Nicodemus is probably as guilty as a lot of people are today. They just couldn't grasp the fact that the God that he wanted to serve was so much bigger, so much mightier, it's infinitely more in person than they could ever begin to realize. Now, I would contend the vast majority of Christians are guilty of the same thing today. Far too many Christians lead defeated lives because we have this image of God that won't allow us to see the blessing that God really wants for us to live. We get in the way of others. But like Nicodemus, we have to ask ourselves, how do we get from here to there? How do we do that? How do we let God be God in all of his glory? Jesus, in effect, tells Nicodemus that he needed to let the Holy Spirit guide him. And Jesus calls all of us to be born again. Jesus calls us all to a new orientation towards life. An orientation that has us walking by his side. Now, when people hear the words, you must be born again, they get a little nervous. And they want to put about as much distance between themselves and those crazy, wacky people that, you know, are, are thumping a Bible or something. Because it makes them uncomfortable. Others, they're quick to point out their born again experience. Might have happened 95 years ago, but they cling to it as if it's the sole definition of their Christian faith and journey. You know, I've heard it said you can't put your hand in the same train twice. The reason being, you know, there's current. The water's all continually mixing and flowing down the stream. Every second of the day, the old washes away and the new takes its place. Now, when Jesus said you must be born again, he wasn't talking about a one-shot deal. He was talking about a way of life. He was talking about, if you want to be born again, you've got to be born again, 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 and again. Every day is a fresh start. Every day is a new beginning. God intends every day to even be a series of new beginnings. Not just a maze of dead ends. Christ calls us as Christians to be a people of life. Not of death. But in our culture, what do we glorify? Death. I mean, have you, have you looked on TV anymore? What, what are they offering now? I mean, where do these vampires and things come from? And zombies. The Walking Dead. I'm so sick of those kind of movies being hawked on TV. That, I mean, in desperation, you know what I watch? People chasing snakes trying to catch them and get them out of the airplanes. I mean, I, I watch people, you know, wrestling with alligators and, and you know, shooting them in the head with a 22. And, and stuff like that. But there is nothing on TV that glorifies life. And at least I don't see much of it. Well, the Son set the Spirit so that we might be able to live our lives truly as three persons. One and three and three and one. I mean, the doctrine of the Trinity, today, by the way, is Trinity Sunday. Um, it has puzzled Christians from the very beginning. And you can whistle, I don't, I don't think it's enough to explain it, I know I can't. But 
probably the mystery of it all is what really accounts for this doctrine's great power. Nicodemus didn't understand it. So he comes puzzled to Jesus because he believed Jesus had to be more than a prophet. There was something about him that stirred his heart. And somehow, Nicodemus was having trouble making these new revelations that Jesus was giving him stack up with his whole beliefs about what it meant to really be a servant of God. Nicodemus' orientation to God was like that of every other Jew. It's Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And Jesus said, don't think I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I came not to abolish, but to fulfill and in John's gospel, Jesus had said to a crowd of Jews, and I believe Nicodemus had to have been there, and that's probably why he was there after the cover of darkness. In John 10, verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now, to a devout Jew, of course, there is no greater commandment than is found in Deuteronomy. Here on Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. Nicodemus had a decision to make. Was Jesus blaspheming God? Or was he revealing the true nature of God? We've got the same decision to make. I mean, we all got to worship somebody. We all got to serve somebody. For Nicodemus, Jesus I believe is issuing a call to all of us that we would be open to what the Holy Spirit could and would do in our lives if we just let Him. Because Jesus is the truth of God as it's unveiled. But you know the Holy Spirit of God? That is God as He is revealed. Jesus' question for us is will you accept for the truth for who and what He is? And will you be born again? For us, this has to be the fresh start of a new day, part of a new journey that the Lord wants to take with you and with me. And it's a journey not only for here and now, but a journey that is going to last even into eternity. Amen? Let us pray. Father God, we want to be more than just bumps on the wall. We want to be more than just few sinners. All that standards. Power. We want to be your people. And we want to have that power. The power that can throw islands into the sea. The kind of power that can create joy even in the midst of hate and deceit. The kind of power that can transform this world. Reveal yourself to us, O oh God, that we can be transformed in a real service in this kingdom. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our last hymn. How about the battle hymn with the pump? Yes. Is that the one we want? Okay, this is going to be on page 717. Carol's going to be our song name. Do you want to come forward with this?
the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you forever. Amen.